Our first forum, we're going to talk with candidates running for Senate District 56. They are former Representative Aaron May Quaid and Jim Bean. So we're going to start out um, right away um, with former Representative Aaron May Quaid. Um, our, my first question for you is, in July, there was a shooting in Apple Valley. It occurred near your home. It occurred near my home. You posted on Twitter the following, I've lived in this community my whole life, and to see the epidemic of gun violence come so close to my home is unsettling. The frequency of shootings in this country is unacceptable and preventable. We need leaders who will fight for policies that reduce gun violence instead of letting this epidemic continued unchecked. You were in the legislature from 2017 and 18, and now you want to return as a senator. What can be done about gun violence and protecting our community? That's a great question, and thank you so much for hosting this event. I'm Erin May Quaid. Gun violence is one of the most pressing issues that we need to address both in this community, in our state, and in this country. We are the only country in the world that experiences gun violence the way that we do. Some issues that we can uh, take up or some legislation that we can take up, some that I've chief authored as your state representative, include background checks on all gun sales, safe storage laws. We know that children who access guns, often accidentally shooting themselves or a friend, um, access those guns legally from their parents, parents that legally own those guns. And safe storage laws have shown to reduce violence amongst children 85%. We can also do red flag laws that make sure that people who should not have guns, whose family, loved ones have identified this person is not safe to have a gun right now, can go through a process to make sure that they remain safe and that their communities remain safe. And last, we can keep weapons of war out of the hands of civilians. This is so crucial to increasing our sense of safety, whether it's at your business or at your place of worship, a mall, a school, all over our communities because we know gun violence touches every single one of them. Thank you. Jim Bean, welcome. Thank you. The state economic outlook for the 2023-2024 biennium projects a surplus of $7 billion plus $2 billion in reserves. <clears throat> what should be done with these funds? And can we work together in a bipartisan manner to achieve this goal? Great question. Uh, I'm a believer of giving all that surplus back to the taxpayers just because it's an opportunity to spur economic growth. Things that we can do here in Minnesota is produce a business-friendly environment. And I believe in supply and demand. I believe in overall production. If you look at states like Texas, Florida, Tennessee, those states don't have a, a, a state income tax. We could be very identical to that. When there's less taxes, less regulations, it attracts businesses. And business, if we can get government off businesses back, they can do what they do best, which is provide jobs, put forth products that we all need and want and services. And to attract these businesses, I think is probably the best thing we can do as we deal with inflation, record-breaking uh, gas prices. And so economic growth is something that we really need. And it's, it's not a hard decision to make. When you overtax uh, a state, just return that tax money. This will help everyone navigate through these tough, tough times. And also, in addition to that, Social Security. We should not tax our senior citizens. Most of them are on a fixed income. And so as we navigate through these tough times, record-breaking gas, record-breaking inflation, Minnesota can produce a business-friendly environment. And our, young, our youth, we can get them ready for the workforce, even in high school. Thank you. Former Representative May Quaid. There's currently a shortage of workers in all sectors of the economy. Minnesota job growth has trailed the U.S. over the last two decades in job growth. What can be done at the state level to assist in development of workers for our economy and get the economy growing again? That's a great question. There's a few pieces that we can do at the state level to address the workforce shortage. 
The first is I think we have to acknowledge that the American workforce has lost a million people to COVID and hundreds of thousands more to long-term disability from long COVID. And so making sure that we have strong supports for people with disabilities to make sure that they can work in uh, you know, sectors that are tailored to their interests, tailored to their talents, and making sure that they have the flexibility to remain in the workforce. The second is childcare. The pandemic, we saw a rapid loss of women leaving the workforce because they had to stay home and care for their children or be the at-home educators facilitating online learning. And we're not seeing those growth back into the economy now. And so we need to strongly invest in childcare, universal pre-K in Minnesota to make sure that women can stay in the workforce and family members can stay in the workforce because it wasn't just women who left the workforce, it was also a lot of parents, fathers that left the workforce as well. The third, we need to address learning loss because we are not preparing students for a world in which they'll be working, living, and growing. And I think it's so important that we talk about students, yes, as future workers, but they're future community members. And so we need to make sure a whole person is centered in our education, and that includes wraparound services like mental health supports, um, after-school youth enrichment activities to address learning loss, and increasing support for our public schools and our students because that is really where we're going to um, have our next workforce come from. And the last thing I just want to address is that uh, we are also facing what they call the silver tsunami, so a rapid uh, acceleration of retirement from the boomer generation. You've earned it. Congratulations on your retirement. Um, but we don't have as many people to fill that, so how can we be strategic and innovative in how we can continue to provide goods and services to our communities, uh, but not necessarily having the exact number of people to replace those who've retired? Thank you. Jim Bean? Where do you stand on the expansion of recreational marijuana following the legalization of the Delta 8 THC foodstuffs, considering that some of the legislators didn't realize that they're actually voting to legalize a portion of the, the marijuana bill? Wow, great question. Um, I would like to look at the data. What has been the, the cause and effect of legalizing recreational marijuana? What are the st statistics with uh, arrest uh, situations where a person's under the influence. We can look at the data with drunk driving and kind of decide, well, this law makes sense because it's gonna help save lives. Do we have the data for legalizing marijuana for recreational uh, use? And then look about the, think about the family. How would this impact the family? Those are the questions I would love to explore and get more information on to make an informed decision. The states around us also are involved in sports betting. What do you feel Minnesota's expansion of sports betting would look like? Well, I do have a background in sports. Um, the question I will have is, how does that impact the game? What, as far as the integrity, the ethics, would that impact the game? Would it ruin the sport? Um, off the top of my, my head, you, you can think about situations with Pete Rose and all the history that took place with that. My question would be, how can we preserve the integrity of the game and still allow betting? Would it be an economic plus? Who knows, but my, my number one concern is American people, the family, and the results of betting because gambling, if it's unchecked, it can ruin a person's life. Great. Former Representative Aaron, Aaron McQuaid, we now get to the period where we get to ask each other a question. Please ask Mr. Jim Beam a question. Yeah. Um, Mr. Bean, there's a lot of divisiveness in politics these days, and a lot of people are frustrated with gridlock. I'm really proud of the fact that I was able to pass bipartisan legislation when I was the state representative, and I think it's important we find places where we agree. My question for you is, what is something you think we agree on? Um, I think I uh, looked at your website. Uh, being able to provide some kind of assistance for uh, working mothers when they do have children. Uh, I don't know if it's funding when uh, maternity leave, you know, how, how much can we allocate for working families who just had a baby and want to spend adequate time at home. So I think that was something I was like, maybe we can compromise and do what's best for the employee, the employer, and the family at large. Mr. Dean? Uh, uh, Aaron McQuaid, a question. Aaron McQuaid, uh, my question to you would be, if you did win and you were the next senator of uh, 56, would you vote for a bill that would allow parents the right to choose which school their children can attend 
and for their tax dollars to follow that child? That's a, a great question. So currently in Minnesota, um, parents can open and enroll their students into public schools across you know, their district. So I went to Greenleaf Elementary School, but my parents would have been able to open and enroll me in Cedar Park Elementary if they had so decided. I think the question you're kind of getting around is should public tax dollars fund private school education? And my answer to that is no. And the reason is because our constitution and the good of the state require strong public schools. And private schools are exempt from a whole host of non-discrimination clauses that exist in the Minnesota Human Rights Act, which means public tax dollars would follow to private, sometimes for-profit institutions that are legally allowed to discriminate against students. And I don't think that's a good use of our public tax dollars. I will say that I know parents, and myself being one, are really, really invested in their uh, students' education, and their children's education. And so I think continuing to support strong public schools, supporting our teachers, and making sure that students have what they need in the public schools that are in their districts, instead of removing tax dollars that support them, is the best way we can get the best education in Minnesota. Now for our closing remarks, candidate Jen Bean. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Minnesota, we have 19 days to make up our mind as to how we're gonna vote, if you haven't voted already. I'm just asking you to think about three things before you head to the polls. Number one, think about our economy, think about inflation, think about high taxes, think about at the federal level where Democrats are controlling all three branches. Think about here at the state level, Democrat governor, the House is controlling uh, the spending here, and we do have the Senate. They're calling the shots. Are you off better now than you were two years ago, four years ago? Number two, think about public safety, the high spikes of crime. In Minnesota, we've never seen it like this before. And it is true, defund, dismantle, and reallocate funds from the police department. It is a real thing, and it was something that the Democrat Party has stood behind. Number three, think about education. There is a real thing as CRT, critical race theory, which is taking over our education system. It's one-sided. Students, their overall morale is not what it used to be. And my own children, they complain about every subject is about race, it's about skin color. It puts a damper on education. We need to get back to real education, not indoctrination. So think about those, those things. If you vote for me, I'll make sure we get back to common sense solutions. And thank you for your time. I'll be door knocking. And I really enjoy the conversations that I've had at your doors. And it is a blessing to talk with you. And even if we disagree, we need to get back to doing what is right for Minnesota and what is right for our country. Thank you, Jim Bean. Representative Aaron Maquade. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon, whether you're here in person or online. I just wanna, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Erin McQuaid. I was born and raised in this community. I love this community. My parents got married here, um, however many years ago, plus three, that I am old. I went to Greenleaf, Falcon Ridge, and Eastview High Schools. And in 2016, I decided to run for office because of the issue of childhood hunger. We know hungry kids can't learn. And when I was elected and entered into the Minnesota House of Representatives, I was really proud that I was able to pass bipartisan legislation through a Republican-controlled House to address issues for disabled veterans and their spouses and help Minnesotans achieve home ownership. I created the Childhood Hunger Caucus. I was instrumental in starting the uh, People of Color and Indigenous Legislators Caucus. I was appointed to the Energy Commission, and I helped um, introduce and pass bipartisan clean energy bills. Now I serve as the advocacy director at a nonprofit where I seek to advance gender equity through the law, which means standing up for pregnant and parenting people, people who are breastfeeding at work, women, and wages. I live here with my wife and our six-month-old daughter, Hattie, and our two rescue dogs, Jeffers and Soda, all three of which give us quite a run for our money. There's a lot of noise in our house. I'm running because I know that we need policies that are driven by the needs of people and not partisanship, that don't include dog whistle words and red meat to specific bases of our parties, but actually meet the needs of people that we hear about when we talk at the doors, like building safe and healthy communities, lowering the costs of goods and services, supporting our public schools, protecting reproductive rights, and serving our veterans. 
I'm running because we need a proven leader who's delivered bipartisan results for this community before to step into the shoes that our retiring Senator Greg Clausen has left, those big shoes, I'm gonna do it, but in high heels. And I'm running because that proven leader is me in this race. I hope I can earn your support and I look forward to working with all of you on the things ahead. Thank you. These are your candidates for Senate District 56. Please give them a big round of applause.